All right. Well, good evening, everyone. It's good to see everybody tonight. Tonight is our second installment of our Daniel class. Um, we'll be picking up in Daniel chapter 1. Last week we um, studied Daniel chapter 1, and we really only broke the ice of getting into Daniel. Um, and we were asking the question of how we got here into Daniel. And the, and the answer really was because they, they Israel, Judah, um, and the reason I say Judah or Israel, um, Israel is Abraham's uh, descendants. But remember, there was a divided kingdom, Judah, Israel. Judah is actually the nation that, that we're talking about specifically. But it is Israel, and it's referred to in Daniel as Israel sometimes. <clears throat> so if I use Israel, it's Judah, okay? It doesn't really change the, the uh, matter of who it is. But they rejected God, and they rejected God. And because they rejected God, that's why they ended up in Babylon. Uh, but tonight we're going to dive deeper into uh, chapter 1. All right, so a uh, couple things I want to get out of this study this quarter. One is for us to understand the subject matter, Daniel, um, so we have a better understanding of this book, who Daniel is, and what this book means. But also, how can we have this book means something to us in our own lives? How do we make application of this to us today? Not just what it meant back then, but how can I make this mean something to me today? And I don't mean from that, how do I make it mean something different to me now than what it meant back then? I, I think there's lessons in what we learn from the subject here that we can exactly learn from how to put it in practice for us today to make our lives um, reflect some of the lessons that Daniel learned from the things that he went through. Um, <clears throat> but I want to start by reading uh, Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. So can I get a volunteer to read verses 1 through 7? Adam? There's a lot in those first seven verses, and so I want to unpack them just a little bit and see what we can find out and, and see what all is in there and what we can make application to. So first, let's start out with what does Nebuchadnezzar do with the vessels that were taken from the temple, and why does he do that with those things? Emma, what does he do with some of those things, um, or anybody sitting around that area? What, what does he do with those vessels, and why does he do those things? What, what does he do with those vessels? Somebody help her out. Say it again. Well, why would he do that? Well, when you're, a, um, break it down to uh, when you're a kid, and, and maybe you go into another kid's house, and and you and uh, you find their stuff, and then you find it, and you bring it back to your house. Why would why would you do that? Or or maybe you're a um, Jake. 
Okay. That, yeah, that's exactly what I'm getting after. Nebuchadnezzar is, is basically rightfully saying, or in his eyes, my God is better than your God, and I'm taking the stuff from your God's temple, and I'm putting it in my God's temple. He's saying that my God is bigger than your God. He's making a power play. And when you're the people of Israel, the people of Judah, that's kind of a, uh, how does that make you feel when you see that happening? Even though, even though Jehoiakim was doing evil in the sight of God, even though they were worshiping false idols, I still think that uh, desecrating God's temple was a uh, horrible thing to do to, to the people and to see that happening. It was like a final blow to see that those things were being taken away and put into Nebuchadnezzar's temple, right? Um, Babylon sees themselves... This is showing that Babylon sees themselves as the best of the best. They're saying that their power runs the world. They're saying uh, further on in this text, when Adam read it, we're seeing that their education is the best. We're seeing that their government is the best. We're seeing that their language is the best. We're seeing that their food is the best. They've claimed that they are the winners. They're saying that they're the best. They've, they've pronounced that. Um, we see that Babylon places a great value on the young and the smart and the beautiful things and the people. Uh, does this remind you of anything in, in our world today? Really? Um, does I, are you saying that our world today places emphasis on our outward appearance? Does anybody else agree with that? Um, in our business practices, do we place much emphasis on our outward appearance? Has anybody ever heard of the term a headshot? Has anybody ever had a headshot? I have. Can you believe it? You should see it. Um, it really didn't do that great for me. But when, when I took this role that I have now, um, in 2018, on the day I started the job, um, one of the very first things they did, I started in Can-Am in Washington, Missouri, and on the day that I got there, I had to sign a bunch of paperwork, um, and then I had to go get drug tested, and um, and then I had to go to a photographer in downtown Washington, and I had to wait behind a kid that was getting senior portraits made, and and then I had to get my headshot made, and um, you know, and I had to turn this way and turn my head this way and. You know, whatever. <laughs> Did you have to do that, Chuck? Why not? I don't know. <laughs> have you ever heard the terms dress for success? Yeah. What about dress for your next job? not the one you have now. Um, how about always look sharp? Um, how much do we emphasize a college education or an advanced degree? Are there anything wrong with these things? 
No, there's not. Um, and I'm not here to stand in front of you and tell you that there's anything wrong with any of these things. But my point is that Babylon, when they took over Israel, when they took over Judah, they were trying to show their power and their presence, and they were wanting to uh, push their power and their uh, emphasis of themselves on Judah and show that they were number one and they were the winners. But who do you think they were trying to show they were number one as opposed to somebody else? Who, who were they trying to replace? Yes, yes. He did allow it. That's exactly right. And, and we will see that throughout the book of Daniel, that Daniel understands that. And, and Daniel and his friends all know that God is in control, and he does go along with it, and he does these things. Uh, and we'll see that when we get in, in just a little bit, we talk, start talking about the name changes. Um, he, his name does change. But we see Daniel still call himself and his friends by his name at different parts throughout the book. Although he also does allow himself to be referred to as his uh, new name at points in time as well. But he always knows that God is in control. Um, do, but do you guys ever feel this pressure in our world today to be changed? And the, answer, the question is why? Why do we feel this pressure? Paul, do you ever feel that pressure? Good. As a dominating power, Babylon would not want to be reminded of um, God of Israel, right? They want everybody to be thinking of, because the people that they, we just read about, verses 1 through 7, are going to be people that are going to be in the king's court of Babylon, and they need to be um, following the king's court, and they, they need to be doing the things of the king's court, and so they're going to be uh, following the king's court, they're going to be educated in the king's uh, education, doing all those things that the king does. All right. I wanted to just dig in a little bit more on how this affects us, but Nebuchadnezzar, in that verses 1 through 7, he wanted to assimilate Daniel. He wanted to change their names. And he changed their diets, and he changed their education. Um, he wanted to obliterate their notion of who their God was and their homeland. He had taken them out of their homeland, and he brought them into this new land of Babylon. Um, can you imagine going from the land that you grew up in and going to a new land and learning all new things and learning a new way of living, a new education, new dress, new diets, new names, new way of doing everything, all for the sake of forgetting who you were and, and not being allowed to um, do the things that you were raised to do. This word assimilation, um, it was making me think of another word that sometimes I hear being tossed around, and that is, um, um, I hear this word of enlightenment sometimes. Um, I, don't, I don't always hear this word assimilation in, in our conversations, but sometimes I hear uh, in, in our cultures, um, 
maybe enlightenment. Like I've I've thought of a new way of doing something, and I'm and I'm following a different path, and and I and I don't want to do it this way now. I want to do it that way. Or I see maybe some friends that I've grown up with, personal friends that I've had, that will go down a different path. They start out going the same way that I'm going, but now they they start going a little bit different of a way. And over 10, 15, 20, 30 years, they're on a totally different path than I am. And, and it's scary to see that. And I want you to see that um, Daniel does something here in verses 8 and following. Daniel does something here that we need to do that they don't do, that you're going to see a difference in how we need to uh, um, attack some of these issues. Um, I'll go to Adam second. Uh, you go first. Do we know how old he is? I don't know that we do know how old he is. Uh, I, I, he's a young man. I don't. I don't know how old he is. He was there for like seventy plus years. Um, uh, I'm. I'm guessing he was a, a young man. I don't. I don't know exactly how old he was. I don't think it says. I'm guessing he was a young man, maybe in his late teens, early 20s. I, I don't know. Adam? And I wrote on my notes here, time check. I'm already going far, too far with the time. Um, let's, let's move on. But Daniel, I think, was a sincere person, right? I think he was a sincere person. Um, I think he was... Well, let, I do want to do this. I'm going to go back just a little bit. Sorry. Before I do that, before I get to the sincere person, I do want to say this. I want to talk about their names. He changed their names. Look at the names that, that they have. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. These names are names that end in L. Daniel, Daniel, Daniel. Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, these names um, that end in El, that end in Yah, those are names like God has names like that. God is my judge. Yahweh is gracious. Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Daniel means God is my judge. Mishael means who is like God. Azariah means who he whom God helps. Daniel's name was changed to Belteshazzar, which means keeps his secrets, which is a um, Babylonian god's name. Um, Shadrach was the name that Hananiah received, which means command of moon god. Mishael, his name was changed to Meshach, which is who is like Aku, which is a Babylonian god's name. Azariah's name was changed to Abednego, which is servant of the God. There are name changes. These names mean something. Um, when you're named after uh, a Jehovah God or a God-like name, uh, and then your name gets changed to a Babylonian God, that means something. And, and why do you think they would do that unless it had a reason behind it? Uh, there's something in a name. And Ryan, do you have something? Okay. I'm getting ready to auction here. So. Um, when think about stuff that happens in our world today, you might um, 
sometimes hear of churches that think, hey, we might draw more people to our church here in Ellisville if maybe we change our name to something else. Um, because if we have the name outside on the, on the street and it says Church of Christ, you know, we, we might actually get more people to come if we, if we change the name. And we could argue about that. We might come up with one reason or another, whatever. I'm telling you something. There's, there's a name that's on our sign, and that name is Christ. And the name church is, it just means a gathering of people. It means, it means a gathering of people. The word church just means a congregation. It just means a gathering of people. And we are a gathering of people in the name of Christ. We go and change our name just for the reason of maybe we could draw more people or might be more politically correct or we might be whatever. Uh, let's don't do stuff like that. And, and nobody's ever suggested that here that I'm aware of. I'm not trying to start something. I'm just saying there's, there's things behind a name. That's just a side note. All right. Daniel, as a sincere person, as much as I can tell, he was a very sincere person. I don't know how old he was, and I know he came out of a royal family of Jehoiakim, who was an evil person, and he came from a kingdom that was really bad. But Daniel seems like he was genuinely good. And as we study him, I think you, too, we'll see that he was genuinely good. And the more we go through this book, he reminds me a lot of Jesus, actually, and many of his mannerisms. Um, because we see him do things that he is so on point when he does things. Like, when he makes a decision, he does them on point. Can someone turn to John chapter 6 and read verse 38 and tell me, that this doesn't remind you of something that maybe you would see Daniel do when we get to some of these examples of what Daniel does sometimes. Can someone read John chapter 6, 38? Um, Daniel does things not because of what he wants to do, but because he knows that it's the right thing to do. He's a sincere person. Um, let's read verses 8 through 10 of Daniel chapter 1. Can I have a volunteer for that? You got it? All right, so we see that Daniel was a sincere person, and we see that Daniel had a sincere faith that was resolved. And this Hebrew word translated resolved is um, spelled out S-U-W-M, suum. And it means to put or make or ordain, establish or determine. It means to serve God effectively. To serve God effectively takes more than just human resolve. But rarely do God's people ever progress in their faith without a strong resolution to do so. And Daniel was not about to allow a wicked king to compromise his identity or faith. So he decided not to defile himself. Uh, this Hebrew word translated defile, which is gall, G-A-A-L. It's mentioned twice here in the text. It means to pollute, stain, or desecrate. Um, what is a stain? Break it down to something I can understand. What's a stain? When it's what? 
Yeah. I was thinking of a child example, too. <laughs> what? There's something that is seen. Okay. Any other examples of a stain? Doesn't go away easily. Mike, I thought you had something. I got a stain right here on my cuff of my shirt. I don't know where it came from. And I tried to get it off. And it's not from today. But this is clean. Like the shirt, this, it's clean. But this, it's there. Um, it's an eyesore. A permanent eyesore. Okay, a stain is a permanent eyesore. Um, that's right. It's hard to come out. And I was thinking about this. Is it, is it better sometimes to avoid a stain, even though it's probably um, not really easier than it is to get the stain out? Like, I was thinking about when our, when our girls were little, we had on our fence row, when we lived in Texas, we had blackberry vines. And they loved to pick blackberries, and um, and they did it unattended. You know, they would just go out there and pick blackberries. And you know what they would do to pick blackberries? You know what they would put the blackberries in? They would they would get um, you know like a nice Tupperware container and put on a no no. They would just take their shirt. <laughs> whatever what they happen to be wearing and, and just put the blackberries in it, you know? And then whatever they happen to not eat, they bring in the house and then we'd make something out of it. And whatever happened to that shirt, uh, it was stained forever, I don't know, right? I mean, It would have been easier just to take their shirt off and not, or it would have been easier to give them a, a bucket or, or something, right? But, Garrett? Good point. Benny? Yeah, I don't know if that's the same meaning or not, but maybe it is. It sounds like the same. Um, what do you think, you know, in this, in this context about this resolution that he makes about not eating the food or the, the drink, I think that's what it's talking about. He, he makes a resolution to not eat the food or the drink. Why, why that? Why is he making a resolution not to eat the food or the drink? He, he didn't want to defile himself. We... I don't think we can tell exactly why. I don't know that um, from the text, from exactly what is going on, that we can tell that it's because it was food that was offered to idols. I don't know that we can tell that it was food that was strangled. I don't know that we can tell that it was uh, 
you know, we have verses in uh, Leviticus 11. We have verses in 1 Corinthians 8 through 10 that reference back to the old law to give examples of how different things were um, to be avoided. Um, but I don't know exactly in this context as to why Daniel was not going to eat of these things. But what I do know is that whatever this was, it was the king's food. It was like the best food. Um, but whatever it was, Daniel resolved not to eat of this stuff. And he was not going to defile himself of it. And whatever it was, I don't know why it was, but he resolved not to do it. Um, and he determines to keep his diet the same respectfully. Um, what, what can we learn from that? I think that's a good point, and, and I'm, I want to be bringing that out in this class, that there are some things that perhaps maybe it was because it was the choice things. I don't know what, what the exact reason was, but he, he resolved not to do it, and, and that's a strong word, um, that he resolved not to do it. I think that's the same word in our... Um, Declaration of Independence, uh, resolve, and that's a strong word. Um, I don't know if it's in the same context or anything, but that's a strong word that, that we do that. Yeah, it, could, it definitely could have been that. You know, it could have been unclean. It could have been... It could have been strangled. It could have been um, not prepared right. It, it, whatever it was, he, he didn't want to do it. And he could have just said, I'm not going to do it. He could have said um, a lot of things, but we're going to get a little bit further in here, and we're going to see that he did it respectfully. And, and because of that, um, he had a choice. He, I think he was, um, let's go to the next point. It, would you read the next verses, 11 through 16? I think he, he had his faith. It was sincere that he was allowing it to be tested. So does anybody see that, that this faith that he had, he was willing for it to be tested? You know, he was like, I, I don't want to eat this stuff, but let me, let me try it out for 10 days. Um, he, he asked. He could have just said no and faced the consequences, but he asked the question and uh, let, let the test happen. Um, 
that's some faith right there. Does anybody have any examples of letting something like that happen in your world, Megan? That's a great example. I hadn't thought of that. Um, but you're right. When they came out of uh, Egypt and they were murmuring because they, had, they were like, Let's, let us go back to Egypt so at least there we had food to eat. Um, great example. He, he even takes his boss's um, care in mind. In verse 13, he, he says, if it doesn't work out, then whatever happens, happens. You know, um, But he believes in God and he puts his trust in God. Regardless of what may happen to him, he trusts in God. Um, but the important thing is, is that he... De- he resolved that he was not going to defile himself with the food. What are some of the ways in which we, in our world, defile ourselves? Cindy? Yeah, that's right. In verse 9, it says that God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight. You know, God was with him, and God did give him favor. That's right. Chuck? a good point. There's there's so many things that we may be tempted to do or have opportunity to do and the choicest things are presented to us and there's nothing wrong with us taking of those things but for whatever reason we've made we've resolved not to defile ourselves with those things and we do not take of those things. Um, we do not want to stain ourselves and uh, be common like those things. Good point. Uh, we're just almost out of time, so let's, let's go ahead and push on and read the rest of the chapter. A sincere faith sought God's providence. Can I, I get someone to read verses 17 through 21? Cindy?
Thank you. So Daniel is to be commended for his sincere faith. Yes, he is. But as we see here, it was God who brought about this success. As we just read in, in verse 9, God caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. And God's role in these events is, is very much pronounced. Um, but we also see that Daniel was very much resolved to do, do these things, that Daniel uh, did not reject God, that Daniel was given this knowledge, and Daniel was given this understanding of visions and dreams. And when Daniel and his three friends were presented to Nebuchadnezzar, they were found to be ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters. Um, God's providence even extended even into the next political regime, as it says here, of King Cyrus. But it, I think it's important for us to see that Daniel made a resolution. He was resolved not to uh, deny God. He did not reject God. We started out by saying that Israel or Judah was put in this position because they rejected God. And Daniel did not reject God. Put that in a positive um, sentence. How would you say Daniel did not reject God. How would you say that in a positive sentence? Daniel was faithful to God. Daniel was faithful to God. Okay. Nick, you were raising your hand or something. Yeah, I was just going to say that story reminds me of the promise of Abraham. Right? It does. Abraham was pretty much like pushed away from his homeland and faced that double captivity and had to return to his slavery. The only person he came to was a really strong and supposed to be like God. That's right. And so, uh, Chuck? That's right. Every single one of us we have to ask ourselves this question. This is where I'm going with this Daniel class. We have to ask ourselves, are we resolved? How do we answer that? Have we determined? You know, we, I'm going to say to you, you are smart. You are chosen. You are given training. You are set before important people. You have influence. You are young. Even the ones in here that are older, you're, you're young to some people. This is not for everybody, but most of you. You are attractive. <laughs> you're different. We're different. We're outsiders. Of all the things that we have going for us, the one thing that sets us apart, um, Daniel knew these things, and D Daniel knew that he was a servant of God. Daniel knew that he was he was called, and Daniel knew that he had to answer, and he was he had his answer ready, and he was resolved to answer that question when the when the question was asked. And we need to be ready for that, but because we don't always know when the answer or when the question is going to be asked, but we need to have that answer ready. Becky. So next week we'll study chapter 2. Thank you guys.